This is the urinary system part one. This tutorial is designed to review the basic histology of the urinary system. Now it's pretty hard to separate kidney structure from function, so we'll review some basic kidney functions as we go along. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the histology wizard. The urinary system has three basic functions, homeostasis, or the regulation of blood and extracellular fluid, elimination of soluble wastes, and it is also an important endocrine organ. It produces renin, erythropoietin, and vitamin D. Now the kidney is basically an exchanger, and in this cartoon you can see the blood system on the top and the kidney tubules, which carry first filtrate and then urine out of the body, in yellow on the bottom. Now the first step is a blood filter. And then there are a bunch of exchanges that occur between the blood and the filtrate. And here water, salts, acids, and bases are transported back and forth by membrane transporters as needed to adjust blood chemistry. So now let's take a quick look at the gross structure of the kidney before we look microscopically. Here's a cartoon cross-section of the kidney. Blood vessels and nerves will enter the kidney at the hilum, which is also where the ureter exits. The parenchyma of the kidney consists of the outer renal cortex, which contains corpuscles and tubules, and an inner renal medulla, which mostly consists of tubules and ducts. In humans, the medulla is organized into structures called pyramids, and the bases of these pyramids all meet the cortex at the corticomedullary junction, and each pyramid and the cortex around it we call a renal lobe. The tips of the pyramids are called papilla, and these project into a minor calyx or calyces that collect the form urine of one lobe, and these minor calyces drain into major calyces, and those eventually drain into the ureter and exit the body. So here's a microscopic view of what we just looked at in the cartoon, with the cortex, the medulla, and the ureter. Now let's zoom in and look at these regions more closely. First, we see the renal cortex, which is formed of corpuscles and tubules. And next we have the medulla, which only has tubules. Now the entire tubule structure is designed to do three major things. Filter the blood, move substances up from the blood through the epithelial cells of tubules into the lumen, and to transport substances from the filtrate into the interstitium and eventually into the blood. The functional unit that performs all of these jobs is called the nephron. Essentially, the nephron as seen in this cartoon is a corpuscle that's always located in the cortex that filters the blood and then a long tubule that has several main parts. The proximal tubule with a convoluted part in the cortex and a short straight part that enters the medulla. The nephron loop or loop of Henle that has several subparts. The distal tubule that ascends from the loop of Henle back up to the cortex and then the collecting tubules and ducts which will merge into the minor calyces. Now along this route, the filtrate will receive secreted molecules. Other substances will be reabsorbed back into the body. So what ends up entering those minor calyces will now be termed urine and will be excreted from the body. Now we're going to go through each part in more detail, and I'll use cartoons to show you the structures first, and then show you what they look like under the microscope. And we'll start with that renal corpuscle. Highlighted in color, you see the corpuscle, which is often called Bowman's capsule that forms the initial filtrate, so the first stuff that's actually removed from the blood. So let's zoom in a little bit. In red, you can see the afferent arteriole, the vessel that brings blood to each corpuscle. Then the efferent arteriole, which carries the blood out from the capillary networks into a second capillary network. And together, we call this the vascular pole. And at the opposite end, a channel is going to carry the initial filtrate into the tubule system, into the proximal tubule, and that's called the urinary pole. The plexus of the capillary loops that arises from the afferent arterioles is termed the glomerulus. Now let's take another look at these structures. Here's a magnified image of a renal corpuscle showing the vascular pole, the urinary pole, the glomerulus, and the internal layer of the capsule which closely envelops the glomerular capillary we call that the visceral layer, 
and the outer layer or parietal layer forms the surface of the capsule. The space between the layers is called the capsular or urinary space, and this is what receives the, flu the fluid filtered through the capillary endothelial wall and the visceral layer. Now we're going to take an even closer look at the components that make up the corpuscle, again starting with a cartoon. Here we see our vascular and our urinary poles. The outer layer of the capsule, which is the parietal layer, consists of simple squamous cells supported by basal lamina, the parietal cells, and these become more cuboidal as they exit the capsule into the proximal tubule. The visceral layer of the capsule, the inner layer, consists of stellate or, or star-shaped cells called podocytes, and together with the capillary endothelial cells, they are the renal filtration apparatus. From the cell body of each podocyte, processes extend, they curve around the glomerular capillary, they give rise to more processes, and we call these pedicels, or end feet, and they cover most of the capillary surface and contact the basal lamina, and we'll get to that in a minute. In addition to the capillary endothelial cells and podocytes, the corpuscles contain mesangial cells. Now these cells are very similar to vascular parasites. They can contract and they can respond to blood pressure changes. They also help turn over the basal lamina. The cells have a lot of functions in the kidney. They help infiltration and signaling and diseases that affect these filtration processes can affect these cell activities and sometimes that can have serious consequences. Now let's take a closer look at the podocytes. Recall that these cells form processes around the capillaries that are going to cover the surface and are part of the filtration apparatus. And now we're going to look even deeper at that actual filter. The filter apparatus consists of three layers, the fenestrated endothelium of the capillary, Recall that fenestrations are windows that are going to allow some substances to move in and out. Next, we have a thick three-part membrane called the glomerular basement membrane, and this is formed from the fused basal lamina of the capillary endothelial cell and the podocytes, and this is the most substantial part of the filter. Finally, we have filtration slits, which are between each pedicel, and each of these has a gate or a diaphragm called a slit diaphragm that helps control what gets through. Now together, these three components control filtration. So let's go through that again. The first layer restricts leukocytes and platelets from crossing. The glomerular basement membrane is going to restrict larger proteins from getting through. And then those slit diaphragms are going to restrict other proteins and organic ions. So what does get through? Well, water, glucose, amino acids, ions, hormones, and some very small amounts of protein. A couple of important take-home points here. The initial drive to make the filtrate is blood pressure, and so changes in blood pressure are going to change the filtration rate. Second, normally very little protein gets through this filter and into the urine. So protein in the urine can then be a sign that there's a problem with glomerular filtration. All right, that's the renal corpuscle. So now we're going to travel with the filtrate to the next part of the nephron, the proximal tubule. Here's our diagram again, and this time I've highlighted the proximal tubule. Now this part of the tubule resides primarily in the cortex and has a major role in returning fluid to the blood, recovering up to 65% of the filtrate. Now here in these sections of cortex, you can see the proximal convoluted tubules adjacent to each renal corpuscle. Now these tubules have a very characteristic look. The structure consists of simple columnar cells that form a brush border. Compared to other tubules, you can see very few nuclei in the proximal convoluted tubule section. The lumen appears fuzzy and what I call full of cotton candy. And this is due to the very long microvilli that form that brush border. Now these microvilli greatly increase the surface area and they're part of the specializations of these cells that allow for absorption and secretion. And in addition, just like intestinal epithelial cells, they contain large numbers of membrane transporters. Some substances are also transported paracellularly, recall that's between cells, and so these epithelial cells also contain tight junctions that help regulate the flow. And finally, we have interstitial cells around the proximal convoluted tubulum epithelium. They produce erythropoietin, 
which is going to drive red blood cell production. So it's the fibroblasts in the interstitium, not the proximal convoluted tubule cells that produce EPO. Now we're going to zoom in and look at a cartoon of those columnar cells. This cartoon shows a number of important features that relate to function. We have the brush border and transporters that help in, re in reabsorbing 65% of the initial filtrate. And this process involves both active and passive mechanisms, many of which we talked about when we discussed epithelial cells. And these processes are going to drive resorption of the substances I've listed here. And this is also in part driven by that sodium gradient that's going to be set up involving a basal lateral sodium potassium ATPase. Note that this fluid is isoosmotic and it's going to enter the paratubular capillary system that surrounds the proximal convoluted tubule. Now the proximal convoluted tubule also secretes specific acids and bases and these include bile salts, antibiotics, and other drugs. So this is a key mechanism of drug clearance in our bodies. And last but not least, the proximal convoluted tubule cells are also going to hydroxylate vitamin D and release it to those paratubular capillaries. So the proximal convoluted tubule also makes hormones. Well, hopefully I've convinced you that the proximal convoluted tubule is a critical player in homeostasis. Now we're going to go back to our cartoon again. So what I've told you about is that most of the proximal convoluted tubule is convoluted, and it's in the cortex. But part of the tubule also helps form medullary rays, which are these relatively straight tubules that are going to start in the cortex and head to the medulla. And you can see these rays very nicely in this histological image. If we zoom in, we can see great examples of proximal straight tubules in these medullary rays. But note again the lack of visible nuclei and the fuzz in the lumens. In this ray, you can also see other tubules, part of the nephron loop and part of the collecting tubule system. And with that, we've made it through the proximal tubule and we'll pick up with the nephron loop or the loop of Henle in the next tutorial. Be sure to check out, like, and comment on my other videos. Suggestions and topics always welcome. Thanks for stopping by.